Bonsoir et bienvenue. Uh, good evening from Belgium. Uh, my mic was off, sorry. So for welcome to this first uh, online session of the CADTM Summer University. I just wanted to start by saying that you can choose your interpretation language by clicking on the globe that's uh, on the bottom. bottom of the screen. Uh, and by the way, thank you to the interprets uh, for their work. Merci aux interprètes pour leur travail. Uh, donc, thank you to the interpreters for their work. And I'll be continuing in French, says the speaker. So welcome to this first uh, session of the CDATM uh, uni online university. A feminist analysis of the multidimensional crisis. My name is Camille, and I'll be uh, moderating or chairing this event. And, uh, and uh, we're starting with this topic rather than going talking specifically about the debt. It's uh, really a pleasure to have uh, our excellent uh, speakers today. Of course, we would have all liked to have met in person. But this is, I guess, the new the new normal, as they say, a part of the multidimensional crisis that the pandemic is a part of. Uh, the causes uh, were, of course, present before the pandemic. From one year to from one year to the next, the same mistakes are committed, and we see the same toxic effects. Replying to responding to economic crisis by increasing public debt placing the burden on vulnerable people, workers, both in the North and South. This is a way of socializing the incompetence of the wealthy classes, which will only rise, lead to a rise in inequality. And this, of course, is already underway. So it's this is the context of our online university this year. But there's also a context of solutions that have been put in place and have been have fought for to fight for the cancellation of debt for more social justice. That'll, of course, be the overarching theme of uh, our entire uh, summer un university. It is possible to achieve these aims, and uh, we'll be tackling this from different, uh, ang from different angles over the next two weeks uh, with people from different places and organization in an unprecedented uh, uh, format, which will enable everyone to participate, whether they're near Brussels or, or far uh, from near Brussels uh, or uh, or Belgium or far from us here. We have people from Belgium. We have people, uh, Zapatista, Zapatista women. We'll be talking about the solidarity economy. We'll be talking about the link between debt and uh, migration. So we'll be tackling the debt question from uh, uh, with a broad uh, outlook and uh, from uh, with a wide lens and of course we will be meeting in person uh, and, and Liège to wrap things up and I hope as many of you as possible can attend in Liège so today is Thursday sorry Tuesday September 14th and on Thursday uh, 16th of September we'll be talking about uh, those who are crushed by debt and what solutions exist for the global south so let's just start with a few words about the CADTM. For those of you who are not familiar with it, the CADTM is the Committee for the Abol Abolition of Le Legitimate Debt. It's an international network which uh, has existed for 30 years. We, uh, we uh, celebrated our 30th anniversary last year. Uh, we see debt as uh, an instrument of neocolonialism. And um, most uh, public debt in the countries of the South were uh, actually... Uh, uh, a legacy of the colonial area, a colonial a colonial era. I'm sorry, and these have justified uh, structural adjustment plans, which not only have uh, infringed upon national sovereignty, have also led to a destruction of public services, social protection, uh, means of subsistence, ecosystems, and have of course led to an explosion of inequalities. Uh, we uh, both in the north and the south, and we see most of these debts as odious, illegal, illegitimate, unsustainable, and an, as a tool for political and economic domination and so we've been, but since that time since we were founded we've been broadening uh, our our area of areas of work because we see the same things the same types of mechanisms that play in the south we've seen these play out in the north as well by creating different forms of debt a transfer of wealth to the wealthy uh, microcredit student debt uh, 
uh, uh, farmers and peasants debt. And now, of course, these days people talk about ecological debt, reproductive debt, the care debt. And so broadening our approach is what we've done in recent years. And, the, and we see that all these types of domination are intertwined. And it's with this in mind that we see how women, especially some women, are specifically affected by debt. And that's why we've decided to organize today's um, uh, session. Of course, all of this is very topical during the pandemic. We've seen debt just explode the world over and taking on new forms. We've seen a new wave of private debt to, for example, to play, pay one's rent. In Portugal, this had never been seen before. And so it, this is very topical because we see the same false solutions put forward by the international financial institutions. And what is new or what is uh, foregrounded more these days is that is uh, is the is the is the is the scale of the pandemic and the crisis that's gone hand in hand with this uh, with this pandemic, and and of course this has has really brought to the fore our connection to care and to living beings, but which have been made invisible and destroyed by measures aimed at a so-called re, uh, rep repaying the debt in the North and South. So these are questions that feminist econ economists have and feminist struggles have been tackling for years now, but I think these are have become even much more front and center during this crisis. And so we have our, our, our the CADTM has a three publications actually that do deal with this question of debt from a feminist uh, perspective. Eric Toussaint has a new book on the World Bank that we're looking about uh, gendered strategies uh, for debt uh, accumulation. We also have uh, a, a book coming, uh, a co-edited, uh, an edited work coming out next spring that I'll be coordinating with Christine van den Berlin and uh, there are a number of uh, women authors. And <coughs> thanks to Bea, by the way, for putting together this event. And thanks to uh, her and Remy for dealing with the technical questions. We shouldn't forget the people who are uh, behind the scenes, as it were. You can uh, look, take a look at our site, cadtm.org, and, you, and you'll see all our past publications and our activities. And you can also find us on uh, Facebook. And of course, you can even visit us in person. We have our offices in both Liège and Brussels. And just uh, to wrap up with these uh, somewhat technical questions, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. And this uh, event will be uh, broadcast on our YouTube channel. And so you can um, send the link to your friends or people who, are even, who you don't even feel are your friends. <laughs> and so, so what we're going to be talking about this evening is the fact that the increase of public and private debt ha has con direct consequences on household economies and specifically on the life of women. Of course, uh, it's women who uh, shoulder the responsibilities tied to social reproduction and to take on debt to support their families, to, to feed themselves, to house themselves, and to uh, get uh, proper health uh, care and services. And they're the ones who always have lower incomes. And so when crises take place, they're not able to pay back their debt. And this also uh, traps them off in often violent households. So this is a way to show how women are affected in their daily lives. And so debt is a central question, therefore, both for capitalism and for the patri patriarchy, because it's they both rely on undervalued work of women, whether in uh, uh, health care and in t education or for free care uh, services uh, that... Uh, when uh, that are especially used when public services such as daycare services are they're not provided or are reduced or eliminated uh, and feminist movements have understood this for years now and have been building alternatives to uh, market profitability and um, we'll be talking about the types of campaigns and uh, initiatives that have been taken and we'll be providing links to uh, uh, initiatives uh, these initiatives and to us, of course, if you want to stay in touch with those who are working uh, diligently on these questions, which, of course, uh, as uh, as we, we all believe, uh, these are fundamental questions. And so yeah, I now have the uh, pleasure of uh, introducing Silvia Federici, one of our speakers, who is a 
uh, an Italian and American scholar, teacher and activist, and for many years has been a key uh, figure within anti-capitalist feminism. You've given a lot of thought to questions of capitalist globalization, uh, its effect on the planet, uh, com campaigns for domestic wage wages in New York, uh, against structural adjustment programs in Africa. You've written a number of books that have uh, really uh, shifted the goalposts on uh, a number of these uh, a number of these questions such as Calibin and the witch women the body of primitive inflation we're also joined by veronica gago who's a professor of social sciences at the university of buenos aires professor at the, at the instituto de altos estudios universidad nacional de san martin and assistant researcher at the national council of research and she's uh, a especially a, a, a feminist activist a member of ni una menos not one fewer and you've done a uh, very uh, focused work on the connection of debt to women's uh, work and oppression. So I'll first be giving the floor to Sylvia for 30 minutes and then Veronica will have 30 minutes. And just so you know, we'll have two rounds of uh, Q&A. And so if though for participants who wish to do so, you can uh, put your uh, ask to take the floor in the chat uh, by writing your name and language and where you are. And you can also use the chat if there are any technical problems. And of course, you can use the chat uh, during the Q&A period. Uh, now give the floor to uh, uh, Sylvia. And so your book is uh, entitled Capitalism, Debt, pa Patriarchy. Uh, and you're, uh, you also have a book that's a Patriarchy of the Wage Notes on Marx, Gender, and Feminism. Actually, I'll be speaking in French and then I'll take the floor in English. So Veronica and I actually talked about this and we thought that she would start. Yeah, that's fine as well. But that's uh, what we decided. So perhaps it would be better for Veronica to start if that's okay. Yes, of course, Veronica, over to you. Veronica Gago, and you'll be speaking on the same subject. Thank you very much, Camille. Thank you very much to Silvia. Oh. And I'd also like to uh, especially thank Bea, who put together this event and who uh, really was in charge of organizing this uh, event these past few weeks and months. And so it's really a pleasure for me to be here with you. I'd like to raise four uh, points uh, for our debate and discussion, uh, in, in specific, specifically in relation to the questions you raised, Kami. First of all, the first point I'd like to make is how the diagnosis regarding sexist uh, and racist and colonial capitalist and extractivist violence, the diagnosis about these different forms of violence is which is put forward as a kind of practice practical diagno, diagnosis by feminism in different places has has looked at the experience in argentina of course uh, i'm argentinian and not only in argentina but for, for us here in argentina and argentina and elsewhere debt has emerged as a fundamental component of the this violence to understand the violence of debt and the different forms of violence that connect are connected through debt uh, Lucia Caballero, we've worked on financial violence to work on the specific nature of debt violence. Uh, this has really been central to our work, and this has been a fundamental step forward in our understanding, I believe. In Argentina, we've seen how the debate on indebtedness, uh, the over-indebtedness of households in relation to the country's external debt, ha has been has, feminism has you mobilized this as 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 a political question as a as an excellent way to carry out educational work on the impact of debt on people's daily lives i think this is a first important point that i'd like to make that try we should try to connect economic violence in particular the violence of debt financial violence to structural violence, especially sexist, racist, patriarchal, and colonial violence that we see. 
connecting a, a feminist, popular feminist reading to what finance, the role of finance in contemporary capitalism. I think this is an important um, a political uh, approach because it's also about contesting who should talk about debt. What's the vocabulary we should use to talk about the debt? And first and foremost, what does this mean for political mobilization from the starting point of indebtedness. And I think this is a contribution of uh, the feminist movement, the women's movement, about how we can see the role of debt in what places and on what uh, in on in what areas and what in what regions and what on what bodies does the debt land, as it were. And what's the role of systematic debt in countries, in households, and for and for individuals, but I think another important point for feminist economics is to draw the lines to to bring out things that have been in invisible. And how these and how these have been translated into austerity and how this austerity has led to in greater deadness of households of working class neighborhoods i think this important connection of what i would call the household debt or domestic debt with this connection between the external uh, or national debt to household and individual debt is very important <laughs> la obligación financiera como violencia económica con las violencias, insisto, machistas. We have to link up the different types of violence. I think that this helps us to understand that debt is promoted as a type of solution, uh, but it's a false solution. We've already been speaking about the meaning of that. And we've looked at the, uh, the, the impact that this has on the most impoverished economies around the world. And we, uh, we can see it's a savage way of trying to offer solutions given the daily situation. So I think it's very important that we understand this, that we have to shed light on this and uh, make people aware of it and uh, make and uh, well in we have um, drawn up the we've been examining the differences so access to certain rights access to certain resources to certain public resources this has to be um, it's the financial corporations that often take advantage of this to extract uh, the meager resources of public from public institutions and to capture the social aspect and to, to have control over social aspects. So this is very important. We have to see how financial uh, financialization has an impact on uh, populations above all women, women who don't necessarily have formal work and final and formal work. Well, work, well, the, the corporations often take advantage uh, in a number of different ways. So I think that that's a fundamental point as well. Now, uh, the transnational aspect is one that is key and and uh, what we have to do is look at how we can analyze how we can um, look at the wider context and look at feminist international from we look at things from a feminist international approach as well another point i wanted to bring up was the analysis that we share uh, when it comes to extractivist models now speaking about extractivism also is a is something a las dinámicas extractivistas territorios que sabemos que se apoderan de ciertos recursos ciertos bienes comunes eh, que hoy lo vemos eh, además en América Latina con una avanzada 
cada vez más intensiva, una avanzada propiamente eh, neocolonial. We need, we need to connect, come together and look at how finances operate in an extractive way as well. Um, so extracting energy, extracting common resources, and this through um, debt. And of course, there are connections between people, so financial resources and um, different resources, common shared resources. And so this financial extractivism is something that we have to take into account for women, but also the those who have lost the most in their territories, who are uh, subject to extraction through and by um, generating debt in their day-to-day -day lives. So we're working on um, one concept which is broad and extractivism, and it's about uh, looking about uh, how they try to steal from people, but also exploitation, work exploitation, labor exploitation, which is not uh, work which is not recognized as work. So popular economies, um, the people's economies, but also in terms of reproduction, in terms of women, lesbians, the LBGT community, and um, many of those are suffering crises in their community. So this, so it's about looking at extractivism and rethinking the extractivist dynamic that we see in terms of debt in certain, on certain bodies and in certain areas. And I think that this allows us to connect up with the, uh, it allows us to connect uh, urban territories with suburban uh, peasant farming and indigenous communities. And it also helps us to understand what happens in Latin America or elsewhere, where it's not just about extraction of natural resources or common resources, it's also about extraction and exploitation of the workforce, which is more and more informal, more and more precarious in its nature. They don't even need a salary to have access. What we have seen through this financial extractivism in the pandemic has been a huge intensification, a uh, savage intensification and we have seen that the uh, extracting income um, from people through rent extracting money from people through the rent that they have to pay for their accommodation and also the dollarization of uh, medicines medication and food and this is not just related to vaccines it's also uh, re related to agribusiness and how that agribusiness plays out when it comes to ecological disasters, but also in terms of the dollarization of foodstuffs. And it's also extractivism um, in education, and we could continue talking about this, but this extraction of um, income via rent is something that was exacerbated through the pandemic, and it can be seen as a form of extraction and in terms of social production, so uh, accommodation, electricity, power, water, and other good supply to people. And so this allows us to connect together different anti-capitalist struggles, and it helps us to think about the anti-debt struggle as an anti, uh, as an anti-capitalist struggle. And I'd say that in Argentina or in Latin America in general, or even beyond Latin America, it's very important to link out the issue of debt with work, reproductive work, but also the feminist strike that has been the main political tool to create visibility. And it helps us to speak about what work means nowadays from, nowadays from a feminist perspective. So the dynamic of feminization of labor, of the workplace, and um, setting up a place, a space for reorganizing ourselves and to rethinking how labor should work, how um, the workplace should be shaped. And this helps us to understand the links between link, link, uh, the links between debt, debt not only as a fictitious uh, structure, but also the links between the financial, the financial sphere and re 
re the reproductive sphere. And what we have seen is that the domestic debt and above all the excessive debt of homes has become a bit like a, a, a mechanism to structure the way people work. So it structures certain obligations for people in terms of their time, in terms of what they can do. And many people who uh, do not have work and um, work has become something that is imposed upon people. And some people don't have any income at all. They don't have social security, pension, uh, salary, and uh, so debt has become a, an obligatory element uh, for any earnings. And uh, we've been looking at what, do, what does debt really mean as a tool, as a dynamic, and uh, looking at this uh, social vitality and what the cross-cutting nature of, of debt is, so we can see that we've got debt for women, debt for women from people's economies, um, debt for peasant farmers, debt for mothers who are in charge of households. So these are different forms of debt, and they uh, respond to different dynamics within society and different types of lifestyles, and are applicable to different types of lifestyles. And a final element regarding the pandemic is that as our friends from the feminist movement in Chile have suggested with a very synthetic, a very uh, summarized way of speaking, they say we're not going to pay for this debt with our bodies and with our territories. And what we have been saying is no, no one, no women more to be indebted with our bodies. And so the debt We've been looking at this together with Silvia Lucy, with a load of other colleagues who are uh, in the book that we have put together. And we've been bringing together many different experiences. So these are all mottos that summarize that the political awareness and the way of carrying out feminist pedagogy around the issue of debt. And the issue of debt is becoming central in the pandemic because debt has been on the rise in our country and also at national level and in homes so we have seen a uh, we've seen lots of different types of debt arising in the pandemic so debt for uh, how we live how for our health care our food and economic uh, aspects uh, so and for example work and the labor sphere and a debt as a way of managing crisis and for times of emergency and it's also used as a way to overcome and get through a crisis so uh, debt has been increased and even when it is increased what we find is that the burden of reproductive work goes up and these are uh, essential jobs so this is essential work and uh, we should think about the sustainability of life and recognition for that and who are the workers who have truly been on the front line as well but the question is those workers why is it that they do not have recognition the necessary recognition in terms of the income that they receive from their work what we find is that they are impoverished because of the work that they are burdening themselves with um, during this pandemic, first and foremost. And the discussion that the feminist movements are bringing forward with their different initiatives, their different movements, their different actions, it is related to creating greater visibility for uh, and linking up better with the territories that are not extractive territories. So looking at different dynamics, different alternatives for providing food, for managing resources and gaining resources and it's not having an extractivist approach with territories i think that what we're trying to do is with well we're trying to look at how we can reorganize work how we can um, appreciate work in a different way and what it means to provide the right um approach but it's looking at depth and how it is often seen as the solution, the exit from these multiple crises that we are living through in the pandemic. And in Argentina, we've been working on different initiatives on uh, creating more 
uh, statistics, understanding better what this means in our day-to-day -day lives. And a number of different organizations have included this in their work, as I was talking about. So debt as a tool for several territories, and uh, it's about talking about who, who pays for the crisis. And so the, that knowledge produced by our organizations, above all, from the feminist organizations, I think that is of great value. And it helps us to address the question once again of what disobedience in the face of debt really means and how we can uh, overcome the, uh, the issues that have been rising as a result of debt. Thank you very much. Merci, Véronique. Uh, bah, tu pouvais parler cinq minutes de plus si tu voulais, Thank mais ça peut laisser plus de temps. Well, you could have spoken a bit more, but uh, that just, uh, so you, yeah, you have gone time, over time a little bit, but that leaves less time for questions afterwards. So now over to Sylvia. And uh, first of all, you know, um, greetings to everybody who's listening to us and um, many, many thanks to Camille and all the, you know, Bea and the companions of the CDMT that for years and years have been struggling against the debt and providing an incredible amount of analysis of information that has helped to connect movements, you know, across the globe. This has been a fantastic work and I think that this work now has to be broadened and been taken on by other women's organization, feminist movement, because, you know, as Veronica has so powerfully, you know, uh, demonstrated uh, the deuda, the, the debt is something that uh, it's, a, it's a structure of uh, capitalist exploitation and capitalist domination today across the world. Uh, I think that uh, what I can do now in the half an hour that I have is to try to think again, you know, something about the history of the, of the debt and what it means, you know, from a point of view of the kind of political work that we need to do to organize a broad movement, you know, and particularly a feminist movement against the debt. I want to say that uh, already in the 1990s, you know, uh, the debt, the question of the debt, and particularly, you know, the debt crisis, which was totally engineered, totally artificial, and uh, was at the center of the anti globalization movement. So we already have the experience of a broad movement. But I think that to approach this struggle, from a feminist viewpoint, you know, I think uh, it's and particularly from the point of view of the struggle of women at the popular level of popular women's movement, it's uh, particularly important today for many of the reasons that Veronica has mentioned. Uh, the debt, what, what is the debt? You know, I want to say that first of all, it's important to see that the debt the national debt and then the individual debt, the personal debt, which are completely connected. You know, in fact, one produces the other. You know, the external debt, the state debt, you know, is in fact the, the generator, is the father of the individual debt. Because on the basis of the, of the state debt, the national debt, you know, all the cuts, all the cuts in social services, in forms of employment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, are justified. So there is a direct filiation between the two. And it's very clear when we look at, you know, the context in which, you know, the debt crisis, which was, you know, the big bang, it was the beginning, you know, of the politics of that. You know, if we look at the context in which it was generated, and we look at these consequences and the way it is organized in the way it has transformed into one of the most powerful forms of disciplining and enslavement, because we are talking about how the debt is actually mortgaging the future of millions of people 
who now no, cannot in any way free themselves. They have to take on any job that comes along and they have to in basically sacrifice all their energy and so on, you know, to pay, uh, to pay the debt, you know, that all of this you know, was a political strategy that I, in my, in my view, and I don't think I am alone in saying this, was organized directly as a response to the kind of uh, struggle, to the kind of transformation that was produced through the 60s in particular, but actually through the history you know, of the 20th century, you know, by the anti-colonial struggle, that even though did not produce the world, the anti so many anti-colonial activists, you know, fought for, even though it did not produce the world, nevertheless changed the power relation, create a new generation of people, African, Latin America, Caribbean, Asian, who wanted another world, who were fighting, organizing to reclaim the resources that had been robbed from their country. And uh, the debt, the politics of the debt organized at the highest level of capitalist power, the World Bank, the IMF, which really are the expression of the will of the main capitalist nation, the European Union, the United States, when you look at who are those who are voting, you can see, you know, you can see that uh, it's really, you know, the US, the European community behind, behind uh, the politics of the debt crisis and structural adjustment. So this was a political strategy a political strategy that was meant to destroy the struggle and to reinstitute the type of colonial relation, reinstitute the type of colonial relation that had dominated, I mean, the basically a new type of colonialism. So we are speaking of a different type of extractivism, but we are speaking also about new type of colonialism and imperialism. You know, the International Monetary Fund has been the, the agent of the new imperialism in the 20th and the 21st century, you know, and uh, and we can see that very clearly. We can see that very clearly in the consequence of the crisis. In the name of the national debt, practically every government, and this of course is known, but let's repeat it. Practically every government, in particular, in particular, you know, nations, governments that have just come out of an anti-colonial struggle, who were engaging, you know, under the pressure of the population, were engaging in a process of reconstruction, right? And that process was like basically terminated, destroyed, right? By this uh, first, the, the encouragement by, by the international bank and government for this country to take on loans and then, of course, raise the cost of the dollar, et cetera, et cetera. The consequence you know, has been that all these governments have had to completely disinvest in any form of support to the social reproduction, cut in wages, you know, uh, cut in, in any form of social services. And this is where, and this is where, and, and this is where the national external debt begins to generate, you know, the individual debt. Because once the social services are cut, you know, one, many industries are shut down because presumably not enough productive, et cetera. When you have monetary devaluation, massive, massive monetary devaluation, you know, whereby the money that people have, whatever money they have becomes totally useless. It's paper. Then of course, you have to begin to go to money lenders, to different money lenders. And uh, the state has to go to money lenders, goes to the International Monetary Fund, but also individual. So this is one, it's very important to see the politics, to see, because we need to understand that uh, and get away from the kind of ideology, from the kind of ideology that unfortunately all too often you know, people internalize, which is 
that the debt is their fault. That the debt is their fault. And here is the second point that I want to make, you know, uh, when we are thinking of, uh, you know, the, from the, the, the question of the debt from a political point of view, from the point of view of building a movement, right? The having a debt, you know, and now we are talking in particular about the personal debt, having a debt, you know, and, and the politics of that, you know, of indebtedness, you know, is a politics that disaggregate people. It's not a politics that encourages unification. Exploitation at the point of, pro other so-called point of production, you know, when you are a factory, when you are a worker in a factory, right? Well, you are with other people, you know, the, the, the unity of, of uh, the, the, the condition of work incentivize the recognition of exploitation, incentivize the organizational capacity of worker, right? The debt attacks you individually. It's a almost individual relation between and the bank. This is one of the other important structural changes that has taken place. No? Extractivism, exploitation through financial means, through indebtedness, you know, is a process that individualizes exploitation, that disaggregates the capacity you know, for response. Uh, because again, mechanism of guilt. You know? And here I want to say that, uh, you know, uh, I've seen these dynamics, you know, very strongly operating in the United States, where, for example, you know, starting with the 1990s, we began to see the massive indebtedness of the student population, because in the name of the national debt, the United States government and every uh, has completely cut decimated the subsidies to public education, no? so that in order to go and acquire to a university and acquire a college degree, you know, most students you know, have to take on incredible loan. And uh, you know, we have seen a proliferation of companies that have completely speculated you know, on giving extremely high interest rates and I will see. I will say that the majority of the victims, you know, have been in particularly women, and black women in particular, who are those who are carrying the largest amount of student debt, as they are those who are carrying the largest amount of medical debt and other forms of debt. So, the debt indebtedness is a very useful political strategy and economic strategy of extracting, as Veronica was saying, you know, of, of uh, extractivism, you know, in terms of accumulation through the extraction of people's energy, intensification of exploitation, intensification of forms of, of labor, unpaid and uh, or very uh, paid at a very, very, very low level that does not allow you know, survival. And uh, it's very useful because uh, it's, not, it's not the situation that encourages unification. Although we have seen more and more, the movement are actually forming and we should talk about that. You know, we should talk about that. And then the importance of a gender perspective, the importance of a feminist perspective, because it's very clear that the politics of that has in fact, you know, been most directly and most uh, thought about it and devised, you know, uh, to, to extract women's labor. And uh, here, you know, there's a whole literature, a whole discussion that with more time, you know, we could engage in uh, on the question, for example, of microcredit. You know, I think uh, Veronica says something very important you know, the fact that you know, national policies are now increasingly devised in such a way that with regard to wages, with regard to employment, et cetera, that more and more large population have to depend on indebtedness for their survival. 
They have to depend on indictment, which means that what is a serious a stake is a broad scale, large scale, global scale process of esclavization. It's a process of esclavization. You don't only have to tie up people to a tree, you know, to actually turn them in, into a, a slave, but you have you know, to do in such a way that every moment of their life is actually dominated by the need you know, to repay. Because if you do not repay, for example, like the, the experience of the state is, I, I know it is now uh, becoming a very, very large scale, is that first of all, you disappear you know, as a person. There's very less and less things that you can do if you don't repay your debt. You know, but secondly, you know, the debt has generated a tremendous amount of violence. Not only amount of domestic violence, because in a family, in a family where there is more debt, uh, tensions escalate. And uh, we have seen the statistic that women are more likely to be brutalized, you know, in the presence of a family which is in that indebted. No, but also public violence because the companies, you know, that are giving loans, you know, are responding with a tremendous amount of violence when people do not pay. Violence of all type, you know, psychological because they may call employers, they might call friends, they might try to basically disgrace you, disgrace you publicly. And in many cases, in a number of countries, there are also tales of people, women, for example, being beaten because they had not paid back the loans they had taken through microcredit. But back to the question of why women have been the target. And you can really see with the whole politics of microcredit, which is a micro fraud. Microcredit is a micro fraud. There is now increasing evidence that the only women who have really actually prospered or improved their situation through the microcredit are the women who have been employed by the companies to discipline the women who took the loan or to check on the women who take the loan. For example, in some villages going from, from house to house to check what is this woman? What does she have in her house? What is that we take away, that we can take away if she doesn't pay? In Bangladesh, it is known that, for example, if you don't pay, they take away the door of your house, or they take away the roof, or they take away the big pot where you cook the rice, which is the most degrading thing for a woman. Even though it is also known that in many cases, you know, the money that a woman take the money that a woman take, you know, is, is actually used by your male relative, but she's the one who is made responsible, right? And I think the whole politics of microcredit is extremely, extremely useful, extremely useful. And it's amazing how this has been sold to the world as an initiative to benefit the poorest of the poor. In reality, it's an initiative that has in fact intensified to the maximum the exploitation of women, and particularly rural women. For example, it has been a way, you know, of taking away from women who may still have a piece of land, of forcing them to have to sell their land in order to be able to pay the debt. And the debt is the, the loans have been given in such a way in the context of microcredit all over the world. That, for example, in a rural area, women could not use it to improve their land, to improve their agricultural methods, for instance. You know, because you had to start repayment so soon in a condition in which agricultural production does not give you an income in a couple of weeks. And so the fact that in a couple of weeks after you took a loan, you immediately had to pay back a certain amount of money meant that in fact, immediately you fell into debt and you fall into debt, they will take away the land and except details. I encourage those who have not really gone into the detail of what happens to microcredit to really do that because it's such a perverse 
And uh, ironically, as I said before, it has been sold to the world as, as something that is beneficial to third world women. Uh, but gender, why women? Women are the ones that are seen that are recognized in the eyes of international planners, international politicians, international capitalist developers as being the most responsible towards the community. They are the ones who have the children. They will starve, but in the majority, they will make sure that their children are fed. So it has been uh, uh, many, many times noted that even though you know, the women have taken, for example, the microcredit loan are among the poorest, nevertheless, you know, the rate of repayment, the rate of repayment by these very, very poor women has been one of the highest. So women are sure to pay back, cost what cost, starve, you know, and, and uh, you know, face more and more hours of work. The whole, the whole organization of the reproduction is affected clearly. You know, it is known in many countries that younger children, female children, are being kept home from school in order to help their mother. For example, we now hear a lot about Afghanistan, oh, the women in Afghanistan, and I will not, I will not uh, deny the hand of the Taliban, but nothing has been said about the de-schooling, the de-schooling of thousands of little girls who have been taken home, kept at home, uh, either because the mothers did not have the money, being completely indebted, or because she would have to help and start working at a very early age to help her mother. And uh, so women are, in fact, at the center of the politics of endowment. Women are at the center because also the death is really a counter revolution with regard to the struggle the worldwide women have built, developed, you know, to gain some autonomy, to restructure the process of reproduction, to fight with the state to reappropriate the resources that we need so that, in fact, we can have uh, una vita digna, you know, a life worth being lived, you know, which is now becoming, you know, a, a, the, a vision, right? Or it is a vision for feminist movement across the world, right? So it's so extremely important, extremely important that we place the question of the death, you know, on, on, uh, uh, a feminist agenda, and has begun. Sorry, as uh, Veronica has said, you know, place it at the center, you know, of an international, of a new feminist internationalism, and undoubtedly, you know, the organization of the strike, La Huelga, you know, shows us that this is possible, and so we need to think of uh, you know, the coming months and the coming years and the coming months of a whole process in which this knowledge about what the, the, that is, how it works and uh, how we can struggle around it, you know, is something that now you know, proliferates through feminist movement and what forms of organization, you know, what kind of strategies and tactics we are going to put in place, you know, in order to actually create the kind of movement that began with the anti-globalization movement in the 90s, which I think will have much more power if it is a movement that has a feminist perspective. And I'll stop here, and because I, I also, like Veronica, would like to have more time for the questions. Thank you very much, Silvia. Merci beaucoup. C'était vraiment. Uh, et donc, voilà, Thank you very vois... much, Silvia. Thanks a lot. That was really great. Uh, donc, and... je me demandais s'il y avait déjà des questions. J'ai vu que dans. Well, I was wondering whether we already have questions. 
I can see in the Q&As of Zoom that no question has been asked yet, if I'm correct. So please, if you have any question, feel free to ask. You can ask the floor now. I don't know, Remy, if, uh, if you saw any questions anywhere else. You have the floor in any case. Well, all right, so we've got a few remarks which were written down in the chat. I will read them again out loud and maybe Sylvia and Veronica can answer them. Jawad says that he completely agrees with Sylvia concerning the connection between uh, farmer and student debt. He says that the uh, experience of microcredits in Morocco uh, is a way to force households to take care of services that should be provided by the government or by the state, such as childcare and so forth. And women are therefore the main victims. We also hear from a uh, participant who says that she also agrees with Sylvia. She says that uh, if you don't pay your microcredit loan in Kenya, they take your land or households and your guarantees, guarantors also suffer. Bambi says, I also agree that women have become prisoners of the microcredit systems that have made them poorer. So these are just a few comments that uh, have been made in the chat that actually very much uh, justify our demands around microcredit, which is not uh, the solution that we're often told it is, often promoted by the World Bank and others uh, very uh, fervently. So uh, Elizabeth, on other topics, asks Veronica to clarify what she means by debt Dis and disobedience. We also have a question from Joël, who says, uh, hello, uh, th thank you very much for the very uh, interesting presentations. What do you think of the glass of milk uh, initiative in Peru and other types of initiatives around uh, public publicly funded cafeterias. So this is uh, something that uh, is asked uh, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be looking at it at, at Li in Liège as well. So um, I think those are all the questions we have. Uh, Eva, there's a couple more questions. Eva says, do you think that debt cancellation would free women? I think so too, but what other measures should be taken simultaneously? Yes, good, and good. Laura, Laura asks, how can you explain the relationship between microcredit and foreign debt in Argentina? So I'll stop there and I'll let our speakers answer uh, as you wish, in the order you wish. The first questions were to for Sylvia. So if you wish to... Uh, you can take the floor first, or, or or Veronica can speak first as well. It's as you wish. Okay. Well, I. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll say a couple of things because of the the first question. Yeah, the the issue of microcredit and uh, is um, I think uh, you know what I mentioned about the 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 horrors of microcredit is like a very very small part. You know the way in which women have been vilified, in many cases, forced to leave their villages because they have not paid their debt. You know, it's something, you know, in Niger and other places, the photo of women who do not pay has been put on the door of banks, you know, so that everybody, not only the officer of the companies, but everybody can actually, you know, pour on them their, their, their you know, a criticism. And, uh, you know, so this, this I think, I, but, but I wanted the two things I want to say, the one thing is uh, what else we can do? 
And uh, I think it's something I wanted to say, and I did, that cancellation is crucial. But we also have to accompany the struggle you know, for, for that cancellation with the struggle for recuperation of resources. That's what Veronica was also insisting upon because you, know, you cancel the debt and then if the same politics are in place, the next thing you're in debt again. So the politics of debt cancellation has to be accompanied from a whole other set of policies that allow us not to fall into debt. And here, and the last point I want to make now is that, you know, as it was described before, that is something that traverses every social movement. You know, it's a labor issue, you know, because it serves to cut wages, impose horrible conditions, informal life, et cetera. The environment, because it is through financial extractivism, it is through the debt, you know, that, uh, Countries like Argentina or Chile are forced to sell the lithium, are forced to destroy the forest, are forced to sell for the for the song, for the song, are forced to sell all their resources. So this means that actually there is a frente amplio, there is a broad front that can be organized. You know, there are many social movements that can come together as they did in the anti-global immigration movement. Nevertheless, as I re return, the feminist perspective is central because it's a perspective that locally from the point of view of reproduction, which is really the broadest point of view that we can take in terms of what is necessary for transformative change. Bueno, quisiera agregar tal vez en relación a lo que... I'd like just to add in relation to what Silvia was saying, so what what does this connection what does this broad front mean in our struggles against the debt because what we've seen in the pandemic is that we've seen that, that the fight for housing has been so essential during the pandemic against evictions against uh, evictions prompted by uh, unpaid rents or unpaid uh, mortgage debts and in argentina we had a, a whole debate on demanding wages for community workers or social and community workers that is that is how is organ organize organizing work neighborhood work uh, paid recon recompen uh, remunerated this has been a big question during the pandemic it's not just a question it's not a moral or symbolic question rather it's a, a recognition in the form of resources and i think this dynamic that simultaneous explains what are uh, what are the causes of the debt that means we it means we want more government policies to avoid having to take on debt to meet basic needs privately but there's also the question of having a discussion on on the promise promises of the IMF the IMF forced countries to make promises to make commitments in terms of uh, offering resources uh, in terms of taking on more debt as if this were some kind of natural logical uh, course of action what are the conditionalities that the imf lay uh, sets out to what are they well they're cutting public spending providing uh, certain lands for extracting extractive industries and also cuts to labor protections labor protections. And so, it, and this means let, less resources for public policies, greater flexibility of labor. And I think there's another point that's really important is that all of this, all of this introduces uh, logics of violence in, uh, in our different regions and territories and localities. And so the grow, growing indebtedness means the rise of certain illegal types of uh, economies that are really just a response to the crisis of people looking for resources in the face of the crisis and this intensifies violence in the in the given um, regions and, and localities and so that leads to more law and order approach or even racist and fascist uh, policies 
and approaches. And so there's a connection between all this. And we have to really make this visible, how debt enables other forms of violence, other types of social organizations behind this violence, and how we should, and how this also leads to a kind of micro level fascism, but even institutional fascism. And so I think that's an important point that should be stressed. On the question of debt disobedience, I think it's important to connect these different struggles for housing, for wages, for wages, for workers not recognized as workers, struggle over government resources, public resources, and uh, fights against extractivist policies. I think all of these are organically connected to growing indebtedness, to growing public debt and household debt. I think there's another uh, kind of area that we're, we've been talking about recently is how can we put together uh, new systems, cooperative, mutual uh, aid systems, financial mutual aid in, 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 in certain situations of indebtedness or in certain emergency situations? How can we put together, put fashion another logic that is, does not face uh, the blackmail of a usurious interest rate or the blackmail of, of these forms of violence that I've described that, that uh, have led to growing uh, really cruelty in a number of uh, regions and locality. So what are types of networks of resources? What other what's another type of architecture that we could uh, imagine to build these types of cooperative uh, mutual uh, aid solutions? I think those are fundamental questions. I'd like to just add two small points. Momentito. Bueno. Mm. Oh, bueno, que voy a decirlo en en español. I'll I'll say it in Spanish. So, so, Veronica, you were talking about the Zapatistas. The Zapatistas on their territory have recognized that we live in societies where, unfortunately, we live under the discipline of money, as it were. And so they have banks. However, these banks are completely different from banks in a capitalist society because they give you a loan because you need it when you need it. I don't, they can't, of course, entirely escape the discipline of monetary considerations, but they're not doing it to speculate. speculate. They recognize that money is a type and debt is a type of exploitation. The other thing has to do with the question of the glass of milk program. Uh, someone asked about the, well, what's the what's the difference with the glass of milk? I'm, I'm not that familiar with, the, with the, that program, but I do recall someone like Raul Zibeki, com comrades like uh, Raul Zibeki have talked about how in Peru, for example, that being able to, uh, for children, for little girls, for girls and boys to enjoy uh, a glass of milk, they didn't have access to a glass of milk, that, 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 that parents, mothers should not have to pay for a glass of milk. It's something that this was, that they were able to, to get. They were able to get this resource with public support to provide a glass of milk. So any child uh, could have that necessary susten sustenance. It's not about paying for a, a glass of uh, milk. And I'm actually also not familiar with that specific policy, that glass of milk policy, but, but I think in many countries, social organizations and feminist networks are able to secure resources from different public bodies to achieve a level of self-organization, to put together these kind of popular uh, cafeterias uh, or dispensers uh, with some level of uh, dispensaries with a level of self-organization and organized resources uh, within these different uh, people's and women's networks. And it's about also demanding more 
for these networks and for these movements. And, and this is an important point, a question of public policy. And something that we're looking at now is how debt and how household debt actually uh, absorbs resources from the public purse. In Argentina, there was a kind of uh, emergency income program in the context of the pandemic. And this gave rise to a discussion of types of what, what have been called financial inclusion. But some of us uh, did some research and we asked, what happens when these so-called resources tied to so-called financial inclusion uh, are, set, are given to uh, communities who are already uh, in debt. Well, these resources are just absorbed by banking, uh, financial uh, companies who end up uh, just pocketing the money that uh, was supposedly meant to go to these uh, uh, families, these households uh, for the pandemic. So the, these financial companies are just absorbing money uh, sent out by, from the from the state in these uh, context of these emergency public policies. This is uh, oh, very important what you just said, uh, Veronica. Merci beaucoup pour vos réponses. Il y a plein uh, thank you very questions. much for those uh, answers. I see les... many more questions in the chat. The interpreter will try to find them in the chat. So we have a question from Matozzi. Is if a parallel can be made between microcredit in poor economies and, and consumer credit We also have a question from Matilda, Mathilde. What are the solutions? I think they, Veronica and Sylvia mentioned a number of solutions. Uh, you can take the floor again if you have uh, more ideas. We also have a question from Sol. Can we build a, an autonomous banking organization, a kind of parallel banking system, or or should we continue to demand a kind of utopian solution of proper uh, state regulation, public regulation? We have a question from Manon who says, hello, and thank you for the presentation. Would a universal revenue be a, a solution to, uh, uh, to break this connection between external debt and household debt? And if not, what would a better solution or better alternative be? So that's a lot of uh, questions uh, already. I have, uh, let me read two more questions and then we'll go into a third round. Uh, the, a, the French Development Agency, F, AFD, in, uh, from Morocco. I, the, the presentations were very interesting. Given this feminist analysis of debt, I wonder what initiatives can be taken to ra rise, raise awareness among these organizations that look to microcredit as a way to improve uh, women's uh, condition. What are the solutions to help women uh, who get trapped in microcredit? And then we have the Africa Coal Network who asks, how can women get involved on different levels to fight against debt? And what are the financial options that they can uh, struggle for? Uh, I think that's a lot of questions. Perhaps you could, uh, I could give the floor back to the speakers now. There are interesting new questions around, for example, uh, universal wage or autonomous banking system. There were also into other interesting questions uh, up to our speakers to take uh, the next 10 minutes to answer. And then, of course, uh, if participants have any new questions, they can ask them in the chat as well. So I'll just start. <laughs> I could, I'll try to be brief, but uh, these are good questions microcredit or small loans for consumption, I think it's important to recall that m for many households, microcredit has to do with an obligation to consume. For example, in many, in a variety of countries in Asia, microcredit is provided and, and a part of the loan has to be used to buy product, specific products. And so there's a an alliance, a connection between the loan, the the finance, fin the loan financing um, body and uh, such and such companies. So, for example, uh, Danone Yogurts has uh, allied 
with a microcredit body in Bangladesh and another country saying that, well, oh, moreover, you when you are uh, when you request a loan, I think this is a very important point. When you apply for a loan, a microcredit loan, they don't give you all the funds, all the money that you've asked for. They all they give eighty percent of the funds, but you pay interest on the full amount, a hundred percent. You pay interest on the full amount. However, they withhold. They only give you a part of the total amount because they say, well, these women don't, are not used to uh, handling money. They don't have any experience with it. And so we can't give them the full amount. But from the very start, you have to uh, pay on the whole, uh, uh, interest on the whole debt. Uh, as for the question of alternative banks, yes, well, one, one, such a thing already has already existed in, in Europe, the, the Tantinas. In, across Africa, they have different names uh, in different countries, but, but women in villages create, has, for a long time, have created women's organizations. They gather some money in a kind of emergency fund if there's a crisis of some sort. And, and then, and if someone needs money in an emergency situation, that's very different from microcredit. It's interesting that when the microcredit policy was uh, crafted, it, it, invol it involved women who were concerned with, who wanted to, who they wanted to create women's group to give loans to. And so, loans, microcredit loans are always given to groups. Why? Because the idea is that women will discipline one another. If you don't pay, well, I have to pay. And so microcredit has become a kind of way of breaking down solidarity between women, of dividing women, of um, making police, police women, turning women into police women. Well, you haven't paid. Well, we have to pay. In the past, it was very diff different. Women paid their own. And in that way, the, we could face the different crises. And then the final thing, well, Um, I hope that this will be the first of many meetings and I hope that we can develop a big movement against debt, but um, we can finalize this by taking a few commitments. I'd like to come out of this meeting with a few clear commitments. So firstly, we can say that uh, from this meeting we can create uh, this mobilization that we've been talking about. Thank you. Bueno, me parece muy importante la, la iniciativa que está proponiendo Silvia y toda su experiencia. I think that what Silvia is proposing is very exciting and that the different uh, issues that she's raising with her experience, raising debt and uh, uh, discussing, mapping things out and carrying out feminist pedagogy on the different possibilities and the alternatives that exist, basing ourselves on the issue of debt. I think this is very important. So there's one question that we were hearing about in the chat box from Chiara. So how to, how is it that we can reach out to women above all those most in debt and I think that on this, it's important to say that the different organizations, trade unions, workers in precarious conditions, university, there's a university, the workers in popular education, etc. Et and also sex, sex workers, all of them address the issue of debt from their own background. So for example, the trade union of sex workers here, they were very important. 
and they were uh, helping to avoid evictions of their colleagues and they were uh, standing there they were saying um, we cannot have evictions of this type taking place and then land workers those working on the land uh, farmers they were fundamental in helping us to understand that we need a different type of agroecological production and a different type of food which does not allow us to indebt ourselves with credit cards just so that we can pay for food at the with uh, dollar prices instead of the normal currency the local currency and not having to go to big centers uh, using better solutions subsidies and a corp and avoiding the corporate dynamic of having of providing food so i think it's interesting if we can carry out activist work political work with the different organizations so that we can think through how that in its different uh, how, how it can be addressed how the issue of debt can be addressed in different organizations so we had for example those working on the street and what it means for them to indebt themselves what it means to work and have a stall on the street and maybe their stall is uh, taken away by the police and they have to then take on debt so that they can um, be able to get their stall back and so that they can work again and pay off the debt and so it's about how we can adapt justamente le da su esto su capacidad de acción pero es también lo que tenemos que ir it's about working together uh, investigate how we can work in each place because it is a very concrete tool that because it's easy to present it as a solution in certain organizations or in several different uh, ways of working and so I think that uh, is something that's difficult here but also important at the same time so thinking about political work in different situations and with different organizations so that we can understand what it means so ensuring that debt can um, be included at and addressed at all levels at territorial levels in education and in other things and we're also hearing about ecological debt and how that can be or ecological issues and how they can be linked in with debt so um, i think that's important when what you're saying about extractivism there's one very important issue which is how financial extractivism uses certain territories and this implies intensification so of certain resources and of certain common goods but it's all related to what we were saying so property rent um the the uh, the money for medication as well i think these are all dynamics which allow us to gather together points and map out the links that exist between ecological debt and financial debt Pardon, j'avais mon micro coupé. Euh, donc, encore un grand merci. Je vais continuer à lire quelques questions. Euh, et la première, c'est celle de Tania, euh, à laquelle j'ai l'impression que, Véronica, tu as déjà répondu à l'instant. Mais justement, elle se demanderait comment inclure la discussion des dettes non monétaires telles que… So, a question, how to include um, non-monetary monetary debts for environmental damage, where well, that is really at the heart of many concerns of… Avant de passer aux prochaines questions, euh, beaucoup de questions euh, se rapportent. That's one question, and then another question is uh, the feminist movement, and uh, as we were hearing from both of you, there is a tool to link us up, and I think that Bea, yes, we can post the link in the chat box, and uh, don't hesitate to click on that, and in that way we can remain in touch with the aim of uh, putting together this um, the right structure the feminist structure against debt so we'd like to continue speaking about that and speaking about the more practical aspects of that at the end of the conference and then for the other issues that have been brought up well 
we will hear what what policies can be implemented so that we don't fall into the trap of new debt and the C, the drc saw that it's um debt was in uh, cancelled by international financial institutions but now it is indebted with four billion and so how can we avoid this uh, this uh, circle this vicious circle and then the reproductive debt of women who are in the working class and who subsidize capitalism. Can you tell us something about the link between ecological debt and the debt that should be owed to women from the working class who pay into capitalism above all when we think about incarnated debt? And then, and then we heard the slogan, we heard nothing, we, do, we owe nothing, and then we we shouldn't pay anything and we should remember that women are the real creditors of the social debt and so if we want to develop that we can later on and there's laura here who's asking the community links how are they uh, how do they come together in argentina and what type of and what type of population are you referring to there and we have three more before we can open up the floor again so we've got francoise who says uh, a big campaign against public debt in the countries, in developing countries, that was a success uh, roughly 30 years ago. 40 million um, signatures allowed for this debt to be cancelled in Europe, even when even when we didn't have good communication tools. The, uh, the problem is that the debt is paid off with tools to reimburse debt, so we need to fight against inflation, guarantee uh, real development, which meets real needs, and these huge white elephant projects are not always useful. And yes, I agree. And then we got a comment from Marta, who says, thank you very much for this presentation. And she tells us, I uh, read your book, Who Owes What to Whom? And that this is an excellent tool to think about that and also to discover the way in which movements can put up resistance to debt. And Sylvia, when you spoke about debt as a mechanism for blaming, and for having personal debt to the bank. Well, I thought about the uh, platform of those affected by mortgages. This is in Spain. And I thought about the way that they uh, help people who come together and um, they help those to uh, understand uh, policy and to uh, bring their complaints to politicians. So it is about politics, it's about groups, and these people realized that they were not the ones uh, at fault, but really they just gave the priority to paying their families rather than the mortgage. And they felt that uh, they were having a capitalist strategy was imposed upon them. And then the, and the collectives allowed that meant that people were not going alone to the bank to negotiate their um, mortgage, but they would rather be accompanied so that they were not intimidated by the boss of the bank, the, the bank manager. And then we have um, we have lots of um, people who come around to collect debts, so debt collectors come along and we, are, we have the psychological tool of the media talking about this and saying that debt collectors should be going around collecting debt from people. And thank you for these comments. Now, just to others, well, thank you, Veronica, for the notion of extractivism, which you have applied to other concepts, as we're used to. And um, this allows us to think of uh, another notion uh, in CADTM, the uh, struggle for ac accommodation and avoiding expropriation. And so this is bring together di bringing together different loop, uh, struggles. And so we have we're working to defend people's homes and um, we should um, bring together elimination of debt with an appropriation of common goods. That's what Sylvia says. But I think it would be useful to articulate these demands, not only in terms of uh, tangible goods, because sometimes people think of common goods as seeds or territories, etc. But in addition to that, we should think that the commons is also care and social reproduction and other things like that. So it's really how do we bring together these responsibilities and uh, how do we look at how we put this into practice and so what's 
So one question now for both of you, that we all speak a great deal about the IMF, the World Bank, the international financial institutions. In terms of these mechanisms, I'm curious to hear your specific views on the role of the state, because often they're presented as the victims of measures of these financial institutions, they're forced to reduce debt, but they are actually fundamental actors of patriarchal, racist and extractivist oppression. So I wanted to know your positions on the demands for, as feminists that we can have in the face of what states and governments do. Lots of questions. Okay, let's try. <laughs> so I will start from the bottom and then I hope I, hope I understood all the questions. I, I tried to... Okay. Si faut répéter, pas à me dire, je... yeah, yeah, no, no. Okay. So, okay, I, I'm trying to be brief. This time I'm. Oh, I, 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 I hear, I hear the, trans the translation of my words. I, I, how, I, how do I stop that? Uh, I think you have to put yourself on the English channel. And then you will not oh, hear yourself. Okay. Okay. All right. So, first of all, two words on, on the role of the state. The role of the state is fundamental. The state is not different from the IMF, World Bank, et cetera, et cetera. The state is, in fact, the support of these organizations. So there's no victim. And I'll say this is true also, at least for the majority, for the majority of the states and government in Africa, in Latin America, et cetera. And the reason is that it's really in a way, and this is my, the conclusion I come, you know, because for many, many years I was involved in the anti-globalization movement. For many, many years I was involved, you know, in reading everything that I could and talking to people, activists in relation to the debt in Africa, right? And the conclusion that I came is that actually Governments and state, for example, in Africa, they were happy for the majority, not all, but they were happy, you know, for the politics of structural adjustment because this was one of the way in which they could discipline the working class, the proletariat, the people of their own country. You know, in other words, that uh, you know, a level of struggle had reached that demanded you know, that uh, in a sense jeopardize the power of disciplining of the local government. And in a way, this taking over of international capitalism, you know, even through the disciplining of structural adjustment, in the end was welcome. When you had a government, like for example, in Burkina Faso, you know, the, the uh, Sankara, when Sankara goes to the United Nations and he says that, no, we government of Africa, this is the new colonialism, we have to refuse the debt. After a very short time, he was assassinated. Whenever you had a government who actually stood up, you see, he was assassinated. Uh, and, uh, but by and large, you know, Governments have been supportive because in a way, this international, they could always say, oh, we had to cut because of the International Monetary Fund. This story we've heard many, many times, many, many times. Oh, the cuts, well, is out of our hand. There's nothing we can do. Is the agreement that we made with the International Monetary Fund, you know? So I think this is a very important to keep in mind. In terms of the commons, of course, you are, you are okay, you are absolutely true. The commons are relation. The commons, the idea of the commons is that they are a principle of social organization. We have to move away from thinking of the common only just a piece of land that we are all are using. Of course, they are common goods, right? But the most fundamental expert dimension of the council of what is common is that is a way of organizing society and therefore a way of thinking of social organization across the whole spectrum of human and social organization. And so in that sense, 
I think is very important. And um, yeah, the concept of extractivism, financial extractivism is genial. It's very, very important. Really you, helps us, you know, to see, you know, where here I want to quote the old Marx, you know, who basically said that, uh, you know, capitalism impoverishes the land and excavates from the land in the same way as impoverishes human beings, you know, and he already saw that. And I think what is happening to the forest and what is happening to the world proletariat is really direct connection. You know? And then there were a few other things, let's see. Oh, the path. Oh, I think that the example of the path, thank you, thank you, thank you for the person who brought it up. I, I was lucky that I was able to, uh, to witness uh, in, in Madrid a few times, you know, the way of organizing. And it was so important very, very important. The idea you don't go to the bank alone. You don't go to the bank alone. And this is the idea of the movement that we are trying to organize. I think that we need to learn from all the movement in Nicaragua, pago lo que es justo. We pay what is right. You know, there was a whole movement that on every level they said, we pay what is right. El Barzon, you know, in Mexico, also with their big demonstration where they took the pocket out of their pants, you know, where they threw blood, you know, on the, on the, the doors of the banks, etc. We need to learn from this movement. And I think that the path was very important, you know, because of course, the issue of housing and eviction, uh, then there were other questions about the relationship between the ecological uh, struggle and the ecological debt and the reproduction debt. I think we've talked a, lot, a bit about that already. You know, look, the ecological debt, when, you know, I, I, I spent some time in the past in the anti-globalization movement, for example, reading about how the World Bank Rewrote, re rewrote the mining code, right? The mining code that uh, that structure the relation between companies and governments, say in Africa, right? And they restructured basically in a way because the fact that there was uh, a debt, a national debt, allow you know corporation to basically gain access to territory, to forest, to mining areas, and basically claim, be able to repatriate, repatriate the profits. So it's immense. And all of that had a direct impact on the life of women, had a direct impact. Think when the waters that you're drinking are contaminated because of the extraction of gold and you find arsenic in that water. Think of what it means, you know, when the land that you have is traversed, even as you have in the south of Nigeria, for example, by uh, pipelines. The pipelines that even pass through the village, right? And this is transforming, contaminating the air, contaminating the water, as well as, you know, devaluing the currency, impoverishing people, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a very, very powerful, we could speak hours about, you know, when I was in Nigeria, I discovered that, for instance, the fact that there was a national debt, a debt crisis, meant that government had to cut all subsidy to hospitals. You know what it meant? You know, we say that, right? But it meant thousands of things. Hospital had no money for the electricity to freeze vaccine, to freeze medicine. You know, they had no money to buy even the most simple, you know, surgical material, et cetera, et cetera. There was no money to cut the grass so that malaria proliferated because if you don't cut the grass, the mosquitoes are going to grow et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a very direct impact. And the last thing I want to say is that about, uh, yeah, quien deben a quien, who owes to whom, 
I believe that the center of a mobilization, of a global mobilization, feminist mobilization against the death has to be, has to start with reversing the term. You owe to us. We don't owe to you. And I think the women have to organize to speak about and analyze what the death means in their life, but also see what this work, this reproduction work, housework, and more than housework, reproduction goes beyond the home. You know, all this work, what it does, who are the beneficiaries, how the state, the companies, capitalism has benefited. The state, the companies, capitalism owes to us. We are the creditors. We are the creditors. I think we have to start the movement that begins to actually denounce the fact that they are the ones who owe to us. I think that this is extremely important because capitalism more and more, you know, uh, lives on unpaid labor. The process, you know, unpaid non-contractual labor, you know, they use you and they throw you. They use you and they throw you. And they use you and uh, there is no, your exploitation is made totally invisible. We have to reverse that. And we have to say, you know, we want a different life and we have worked for you. You have benefited for generations and now you have to pay us back. Now we want our wealth and retroactive. Bueno, creo que esto último que dice Silvia es la inversión radical, ¿no? Eh, y el movimiento político más importante, ¿no? Que, que permite justamente... Yes, I think that this last point is the most important element which allows for us to reappropriate in a collective way the, the resources. So the movement is not just about analyzing or being specific about what debt does with our lives, with our energies, how it is a vampire sucking away our resources and uh, the, the labor force and how it's affected, but it also means that we need to think, well, the next step is thinking those uh, movements of reappropriation, taking ownership once again, it's thinking about how we can think about what collective debt truly is so that double movement of having diagnosis, critical analysis and strength for reappropriation. I think that that's fundamental really. And so I have two questions that I've noted down from the questions and comments. So one of them is asking what do community relations mean? And uh, what did I mean when I spoke about that in Argentina? Well, here they're, they're called commu popular community organizations and that's for all social organizations, especially feminist ones that organize this dynamic of uh, social reproduction. So those who look at forms of care, forms of health care, uh, looking at ways of conquering public policy and several points which are well, it's also uh, looking at uh, trade union struggles or guild struggles uh, coming together as workers uh, to find autonomous, independent solutions, popular solutions. And so this community dynamic, well, it's very important. It's a, a key element of these self-managed networks of these ways of uh, managing territories in a different way of uh, linking up politically and socially. So these are fundamental networks really. So the issue of gender violence, that's what is, uh, those are the ones uh, taking over in the territories. So these community, social, popular, feminist relations and links are key in organizing ourselves at the grassroots. Uh, so um, when we talk about feminist struggles in the broad sense. And another thing I wanted to say, uh, is, which is very important here, is the whole issue of financial education. Because once again, we see, uh, at least in Latin America, we see new discourse on the fact that debt is as a lack of financial education. So that those who are not illiterate uh, in finance, they don't know how to manage their finances. 
And this has got a lot worse with the pandemic because the dynamics of making money virtual and so uh, that's also for receiving subsidies and grants and also paying and uh, now you have to use different platforms to do that online platforms and so it's uh, digital extractivism using data and uh, seeing advances in terms of financialization and this uh, really brings forward the issue of financial education and going back to this topic once again of the fact that there's a lack of financial education and that that would be a key of uh, democratizing capitalism but I think that's something we have to really discuss in depth again because it really is a, a, a colonial strategy really it's saying you don't know how to use finances you don't know how to work with these products and so we have to teach people how to do it. It's another way of blaming people. And so I think this is really urgent. And now uh, we can see an expansion of this as a result of the pandemic, an expansion which was not which would not have been expected in the last few years when it comes to the use and the fact that some, some transactions become more virtual and in all spheres, really. So this is a fundamental point and uh, so what is financial education? Who uses this discourse? Why is there a campaign once again on financial education in, in Latin America and elsewhere? So we need a criticism of the, against the idea of capacity building because the concept that was used it was capacity building that is a racist a completely racist concept which they have used for um structure they say we need capacity building but capacity building is financial education it's practically teaching people to internalize the mandates coming down from capitalism you have to understand that it's your fault you are to blame and capacity building is often saying you do not have the capacity. You are a crazy person. You're a weak person. You don't understand. And you're not able to manage your life and do uh, financial things as well. And so this is uh, an important thing in literature. And it is, it is something that has been around for years. It was launched in, by the World Bank in the 90s. And we need to reject it. Thanks for your, those answers. Uh, we have a final question. And it's actually connected to what the two of you were just saying. And many NGOs and international organizations have been carrying out uh, microcredit uh, operations that they think are equitable, that uh, also involve social support and training. Uh, micro insurance uh, provisions. Is it possible to support these microcredit operations, or rather, are all uh, microcredit initiatives to be rejected or criticized? We have uh, eight minutes left. I'll just take the opportunity to uh, ask you perhaps to wrap up. And uh, I'll just remind everyone that. Uh, the link to the pad was just posted in the chat. Very few people have uh, have asked any questions, have signed up so far. So far, so if you'd like to participate, participate in an initiative focused on uh, feminist alternatives to the debt, that uh, alternatives that came up during the uh, the discussion today. And if you're interested in signing up, please uh, do so. You can sign up, and you'll be contacted. So please do uh, take uh, this opportunity to to sign up, but and to break out of the vicious uh, uh, circle of the debt, uh, I'd like to invite everyone to join us on Thursday for the second session of the summer schools. And so thanks to all participants for your participation. And I'll just give the floor now to our two speakers to wrap up. Thank you. Well, I want to say in terms of the microcredit, let's see, I would have to know much more what are the conditions under which, you know, we can support some microcredit scheme. You know, I remember when UNOS 
launched the microcredit and it was all oh, so beautiful. And I'm very, within a very, very short time, all this microcredit company began to put interest rate, began to put all kinds of conditionality. So that is really a question. Uh, but in terms of, uh, you know, last final words, uh, the last final words is to sum up what we said. I you know I think both Veronica and I are very serious about the idea of uh, seeing this and the work with you, the collaboration with you in particular, to you know, build a feminist movement and that clearly will have an international dimension. And I think that one of the things that uh, I would like to see happening, you know, now that we have this link and you're going to have more classes, one of the things I like to see happening, thinking also within my March 8th, is for example, women you know, who have listened, who have been interested, and, um, and many may be already involved in struggle against the death. You know, that they basically, that we need to connect all the knowledge that we have of the movements that are already existing, of the initiative that are already existing, because we are not doing, dealing with tabula rasa. We, there's a lot of already happening and has been happening for, you know, quite a bit of time. And so that would be a really good step where we can begin to come together and connect and learn from what we are, you know, the struggle that already are taking place. And thank you to you all. And this has been a really good, you know, empowering, <laughs> I hate the word, but <laughs> experience. Bye. Thank you. Bueno, eh, muchas gracias también por esta invitación. Creo lo mismo, como decía Silvia, que hay un montón de colectivas, de grupos, de iniciativas. I'd like to say the same thing. Um, thank you very much. There are already many campaigns, many initiatives, many projects that exist already. And I think the question is, how can we create a common initiative? How can we, uh, can we create a momentum by, through a convergence, by combining our, our strengths? How can we can, can share? How can we continue to share in a more systematic way the work that's already been done? It's really essential to do this to uh, to um, counter the um, the fragmentation that exists between our different mo movements and projects. To share knowledge and to um, to kind of join together. If you just look at the experiences we've had in the past years with the women's strike, uh, we've seen that it's a way to create greater visibility uh, among ourselves, to be more visible to one another, to each other in our different countries and organizations. And I think work on the debt is also a, a way to pool our forces, especially in the context of the crisis, even before the pandemic, but now especially a crisis that's deepened uh, during the pandemic. And, and so there, and so we can see the tremendous crisis of the environment, of wages, of housing. And I think what we've tried to show you today is that the debt question is an, an excellent way to unite in response to all these different crises that we are seeing. Thank you for your attention. Oui, merci beaucoup pour cette dernière remarque. Thank you very much for that final comment. It, to tell us, uh, telling us that uh, debt is really something that cuts right through all our struggles. It, it's really uh, a delight for me to see that we're ending today's session with a commitment to stay in touch, to share our analyses, experiences, uh, different initiatives, practices, practices. And so I'll give the floor. Uh, I'll let the person who's in charge of uh, in charge of uh, the technical side of things decide when we shut this uh, when we end today's session. I think it's a it's a new record uh, that we've actually ended a meeting a session like this on time. And um, we will be getting in touch with those who have signed up uh, at the link that uh, was uh, put in the chat. So I guess uh, 
all I can say is thanks to one and all. I think uh, this has given us a lot to think about and to work on. All the best, and look, I look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, Yubea. Thank you, Camille. Goodbye. And the 